Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, and Secretary Sutters, for your consistent leadership and guiding our state through these challenging times. On behalf of our medical colleagues, thank you for your support. We appreciate it. I would like to acknowledge and thank all of the medical personnel from across the country and those at Mass General on Ellison 12 and all of the patient care areas who have been working relentlessly caring for patients from all walks of life. We realize everyone is tired and exhausted. In the hospital setting, we are also tired and exhausted. We are tired of seeing people dying on breathing machines. More sadly, even dying alone, where we, used to use, where we use an iPad to connect a dying patient to their loved ones. We know you are tired as it has been too long you haven't been able to see your loved ones, and the tendency is to simply give up and return to a sense of premature normalcy. There is light at the end of the tunnel, but remember, we are still in the tunnel. The sooner all of us adhere to the basics, not gathering in big crowds, keeping our bubbles small, continuing to wear masks, wash your hands, practice social distancing, the sooner we will be able to hug our loved ones, celebrate the holidays, and return to our traditions. This is a sacrifice for a short period of time. On behalf of all of our nurses and healthcare colleagues, I do want to join with the governor in asking, even begging each of you to follow the state guidelines, to refrain from gathering for the Christmas holidays. We know this is a lot to ask, but this is a price to pay so you can celebrate freely with your loved ones after the pandemic is over while keeping them safe. We are committed to continuing our fight against COVID-19 and caring for each patient who comes to our hospitals. We just ask you to do your part so you don't end up in the hospital, or worse, be the reason why your loved ones, your grandmother, your niece, your uncle, end up in the hospital due to COVID-19. Thank you. Sure. So the question is, can you describe what the experience is like now in the hospital as people are contemplating traveling for the holidays? Right now in the hospital, we are seeing an uptick um, in COVID patients. We are also seeing a lot more patients who are coming in who may have delayed their care um, from this prior surge because they have been waiting. And these patients are very, very, very sick. Um, I will also share that the staff, the nurses, the patient care associates, the doctors, nurse practitioners are tired and exhausted to seeing continuous loss every day. I will also share that there are times when patients who are non-COVID come in with a primary chronic illness and then later on we find out they are COVID positive. And that in itself also presents a lot of stress on the system and the staff. We are also experiencing many capacity challenges. Um, and when I say capacity challenges, I'm really also referring to bed availability. So if you are a patient coming to the hospital, it may mean that you have to wait in the emergency room for a very long time, waiting for a bed to become available. And what we mean by that as well, as far as the impact, also realizing is that if you are now being among large crowds, um, also increasing your risk to contracting COVID-19, also increasing the spread, which also increases our hospital volumes. And that makes it very challenging to provide care for all of our patients. How concerned are you about hospitals potentially being overwhelmed? Should we see the same type of thing we saw after Thanksgiving? I am gravely concerned. 
I'm very concerned about that. Do you think more restrictions are then needed? Do we need to go back to kind of what we did in the spring to prevent you guys from being overwhelmed? Well, we really don't want to see what happened in the spring. And that's why we're really trying to enforce and also reiterate a lot of the interventions that we're asking the communities to do. So wear your mask, practice social distancing, don't travel, remain in your immediate household. If you do all of those things, that certainly can help reduce the stress on the healthcare system. Well, it's really critical for people to understand the threat to our system, and that is COVID-19. COVID-19 does not discriminate, and many residents, many people may not realize that they are a carrier of the disease itself because they may not experience different symptoms. And that's why it's important to implement all of the preventative measures. And that is so critical for all of us to remain safe and to be healthy, and to be able to provide the care that all of our patients deserve. Melissa, what, 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 uh, what are you seeing that other people aren't? That, what are you seeing for a kid that they're not, and that's why they're like, well, it's not impacting me. I think one of the unfortunate pieces is that a lot of the symptoms aren't visual, and so unless someone reports it to another person or disclose that information, and I think that provides a false sense of comfort. Um, I think the other component to that is if there is a false sense of, um, you know, if there is a false sense of comfort related to that, then there's this belief that this really isn't real. Um, I will say, you know, anyone is welcome to come into the hospitals, um, and we see patients lying in beds on breathing machines, patients on different types of oxygen devices our staff going in to care for them at fear for their own lives. They have their own families at home. They have babies that they need to care for. When they leave work, there's still a concern that I don't want to bring this home to my family. I don't want to put my family at risk. Even during the Thanksgiving holidays, it would have been great for staff, nurses, patient care associates, physician colleagues to go home and certainly spend time with their loved ones. However, that was at a sacrifice because we understood if we did that, that would put the community at risk. Melissa, do you feel safe taking the vaccine? And I ask you because the data shows us people of color are more adversely impacted by COVID-19, and yet they're also more likely to not trust the vaccine. So what message would you give them from a personal level? Personally, I do feel safe taking the vaccine. When I look at Dr. Fauci, our, science, our scientist community, I look at our expert colleagues at Massachusetts General Hospital, I am very confident in taking the vaccine. And when the vaccine becomes available, I'm gonna roll up my sleeve at the first opportunity and take that vaccine. This brings hope to us. This is the hope that we've been looking for. It also is certainly a major step in the right direction and moving us back to the life prior to the pandemic. I do. You know, I have an aunt, you know, who was very concerned. She's 70 years old. And it was a matter of me having the, the conversations with her. When we think about Tuskegee and we think about the hearing at a lax cell and all of those kinds of things, you know, it's a matter of looking at the timing at during that time when those things were happening versus now. There's a lot more transparency. There's a lot more honesty. Kizzy Corbelt, I believe her name is, was a senior researcher and certainly helping to create the vaccine. She's African American and she was also on Dr. Fauci's team. And so I think that also helps to reinforce a lot of the honesty and the transparency around the development of the vaccine. Well, I think it's not until the symptoms become more severe where they feel like, oh, I didn't realize it could get this bad. 
I didn't realize that, oh, I just thought it was a cough and my symptoms would remain mild. I think sometimes it's not until the reality sets in where they're in the hospital and now we're escalating the level of care because they've become so sick. And I think that's kind of, that brings home the reality.